I recently read an article from Arthur Adams titled, The Atonement. I was so moved by it that I posted it to my website at grainofwheatpublishing.org, along with two other articles that Adams wrote that correlate with it. I found these articles on the website, tentmaker.org. I highly recommend them to everyone. The direct link can be found in the description below. You'll find links to the other four articles at the bottom of the first article. Yes, I said four, because I did not realize there was another until I began this video study. I plan to put this fourth article on my website. After reading the articles from Arthur Adams several times, it raised questions. This is not at all unusual, for I always ponder what I receive from others. I desire truth, regardless of how it challenges my current belief. This study is in response to one of those questions. As a preface to this study, allow me to share a portion from Arthur Adams' article. Please note that the first paragraph was written by Gary Emerald to introduce Adams' article, and I wanted to include it. There is perhaps no greater faith-destroying doctrine in the traditional church than vicarious atonement. God needed someone on which to unleash his awful wrath, otherwise known as justice. According to this Satan-inspired teaching, every human being deserves to be eternally tortured in a place called hell. But those who accept Jesus as their savior avoid this eternal damnation. Of course, thousands of denominations of Christianity add thousands of lines of fine print to this offer of pardon. Arthur Adams exposes this monstrous lie and reveals the true nature of the atonement. It is truly good news and a joy to all mankind. Gary Emerald, Editor. The common idea of the so-called vicarious atonement is offensive in the extreme and totally repugnant to the principles of justice and fair play. Furthermore, this popular idea most awfully misrepresents God, distorts the truth of his word into most ugly deformities, and totally obscures the great truth that Jesus Christ is the image of God, the most perfect revelation of the Father that we have. We are told that man having been created upright, pure and innocent, broke God's law, thereby becoming a child of the devil and falling under God's wrath and curse. The penalty of the broken law is eternal death, that is, a death that never dies, that is, again, endless life and torment. God wishes to save man, but he cannot do it until his justice is satisfied. Man cannot be freely pardoned and the penalty fully remitted. He or someone else must suffer the penalty before God or his justice, which is one and the same can be pacified and the sinner forgiven and restored to the divine favor. Now, if man suffers the penalty of the broken law, it would be his total undoing, since that penalty is endless torment, and yet the law must be vindicated. How shall it be done and yet save man? Thus orthodoxy answers, the Son of God offers himself as man's substitute to suffer the penalty of the law in his place instead of him. God the Father accepts this substitution and pours the vials of his wrath upon the innocent son in lieu of the guilty sinner, and thus God is reconciled to man and pardon granted through Jesus Christ. As we see, Adams challenges a long-standing traditional teaching that is seldom, if ever, questioned by most. Perhaps the saddest aspect of this teaching is that it portrays God as a despot, while at the same time presenting the Lord's death as an abject failure, since the traditional view is that most of the people on this planet are heading for eternal torment. Suffice it to say that reading these articles was a breath of fresh air. However, such a change in perspective raises several questions which must be answered at least for me. One such question is this. If Christ did not die as our substitute, then why did he die? Adams answers this question in part in his article, Why Did Christ Die? 
This is one of the articles available at the bottom of the first article at tentmaker.org. You can also find them on my website. I say in part because, as is true of anything that pertains to God's wisdom and understanding, it cannot be fully contained nor understood by any one person. So if you will, allow me to borrow from Adams and again ask the question, why did Christ die? While looking back at some older video studies, the answer rose to the surface as I read something I had previously written. Hence the reason for this series on the blood. I hope to answer this question clearly, as well as others, as I continue this series.